Thank you so much, uh, Dan and Dan. So Dan Jurgen should remain here. Uh, thank you, Dan Poneman, for, uh, for, for being here. Uh, and for your kind words. And I'd like to ask uh, Lord Peter Mandelson and Ambassador Carlos Pasqual and Ed Morris to please take seats on stage uh, as soon as the seats have been adjusted. While they're doing that, I'll just quick quickly introduce our closing panel. Lord Mandelson's a former European Trade Commissioner, British First Secretary of State. He negotiated many trade agreements and led the European negotiations in the WTO Doha round, has held uh, too many senior positions in the UK government to, to mention focused on trade, investment, and innovation. And like us here at the Energy Center, also understands the importance of rigorous policy-focused analysis as president of the Policy Network Think Tank. So we're honored to have you here, and thank you for traveling uh, from London to be with us here today. Uh, next is my former colleague and, and friend, Carlos Pascual. He leads the recently created State Department Bureau of Energy and Natural Resources. Uh, in that role, he's the administration's point person on uh, our diplomatic engagement on many energy issues around the world. Formerly was the ambassador to Mexico and ambassador to the Ukraine, so he has expertise in some particularly important energy hotspots right now. Earlier in his career, worked in the White House on Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia at the National Security Council. So as you can tell, there are a few people better positioned to help us understand the interplay between geopolitics uh, and uh, energy. And I'm really grateful to Carlos for being here and for all I've learned from him and for his uh, distinguished public service and for his friendship over the years. And then finally, we have Ed Morse. Ed is one of the country's leading energy economists, now is global head of commodities research at Citi, and before that, holding similar positions at many other leading investment firms. He co-founded PFC Energy, a leading consultancy, uh, was president of Petroleum Intelligence Weekly, he has worked in his career in government uh, at the State Department, also in academia at Woodrow Wilson School, and many years ago, I won't say how many years ago, as a visiting professor here at SIPA. So few people, I think, embody the center's uh, effort to bring real-world experience and expertise to the discussion of policy as much as Ed, writing frequently in the country's leading newspapers and foreign affairs, including in the most recent issue, uh, and engaging, taking time to engage with senior policy officials, and I know they value his expertise a great deal. Uh, and most importantly, he serves on the advisory board of the Center on Global Energy Policy. And on a first personal note, it was from Ed that I first heard that uh, Columbia was looking for a faculty member with energy expertise to start a new center, so I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Ed. So I want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to take a seat now, and we're going to begin our uh, discussion. Uh, I wanted to start um, by talking a little bit about the geopolitical impacts of the U.S. energy boom. So you often hear people say things like the U.S. energy boom is having really big geopolitical impacts, and then they give uh, an example, maybe what's happening with Iranian sanctions, but often don't take it deeper than that. And so my question is, can we try to do that in a couple of minutes? What are the impacts? Does the U.S. really engage in the world differently? Do we deal with countries and problems like Syria differently? Because the U.S. is suddenly a much larger producer of oil and gas. Carlos, can I start with you? Sure. Um the, I, I think there are two things that one needs to think about in parallel. Um, one is that we have increasingly come to recognize that gen energy is an issue at the center of the geopolitics of the global system. And um, it, this isn't new. Um, who has resources and who doesn't have resources has had a huge impact on the way countries can wield and influence power. Uh, biggest examples of that have been Russia, Iran, Venezuela in the past. Um, it then goes by a form of logic that if you increasingly have much greater resources yourself, that it puts you in a position to be able to engage in that politics and the engagement of the actions that countries take that influence the global the geopolitical environment. Um, Perhaps the area that has been most profound, even I think more so than on, um, on Iran sanctions, has been what we've seen happening with the globalization of gas markets and in particular by the advent of LNG and we're going to still continue to see that more in the future. Um, as a result of increased supplies of LNG globally, one of the things that Europe has been able to do is increasingly diversify its supplies of energy. That combined with the very profound changes that have been taking place in the European market 
have radically changed that European gas market today from what it was like in 2009 when we saw the last round of the Russian-Ukraine gas wars. Today, Europe is in a position, not perfectly, there are countries that are still 100% dependent on Russian gas, but increasingly, we have seen that Europe has been able to bring in gas um, that at one time was import, intended to be imported in the United States, and they're not doing that because of our increased supplies of gas. And so, as a result of this, we've seen that Europe has been buying gas from Qatar, Trinidad, and Tobago, Nigeria, increased gas from, um, uh, uh, from Northern Africa, and indeed in 2012, um, Helge Lund's here, Statoil was the leading supplier of gas in the European market. A fundamental factor for that was the way that the United States' dependence on gas had changed. If we had still been a principal importer of LNG at what was estimated about 80 billion cubic meters a year, those gas supplies would not have been available in the market. And so today, when people raise the question of can the United States make a difference in Europe's energy security and global energy security if we continue as an LNG exporter? This is not a question of meeting supplies tomorrow, but it's reinforcing a very basic concept. If there's a prospect that U.S. supplies will continue to come on to that global market and be available to Europe and throughout the world. If there will be con a continued competition for gas supplies and if consumers have a choice, it eliminates the past prospect of what we had where between one end of a pipeline and another, you essentially had a monopoly between the consumer uh, and the supplier. And so what we've seen happen already with gas is a nature of competition in Europe, which makes today's crisis in Europe very different from what we saw in 2009 and provides part of the answer of what we need to think about looking ahead, the increased capacity of that competition. I just want to give one other area or example which I, I think is important that is not always thought about. When you're a principal consumer of energy products and you're seen engaging in markets because you have the need for the commodity yourself, it reduces your degrees of freedom and flexibility in that market. And an area that has become an increasing prospect for energy supplies for the future is the African continent. And one of the critical issues where I think the United States has played a leading role is on transparency and governance issues. Norway has been a key partner in this in the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Why is this important? In Africa today, there is more money and capital flight that leaves the continent, principally from extractive industries, than is annually invested in the continent between FDI and um, international uh, donor assistance. And so one of the things that's really helped us to do is to be able to engage across the continent, whether it's been on the petroleum industry bill and the implementation of EITI in Nigeria, to working to, with countries such as Mozambique who are developing new gas resources, to be able to be a force for transparency and governance. Because in the end, that is going to be a basic factor in the ability of those countries to supply their own populations with energy. And it's going to be a factor in the willingness of those countries to be able to contribute, contribute hydrocarbon resources onto global markets. So just a couple of examples of where it's made a difference. It's not a panacea. It doesn't mean that you can intervene, that you're not immune from global markets, but it gives us the ability to be able to contribute to transparency and competition in global markets in the way that we haven't been able to in the past. Dan, do you, oh, and I didn't introduce Dan, in my introduction, we had introduced you earlier in the program, uh, and you would need no introduction, um, having won the Pulitzer Prize and being widely regarded as perhaps the world's leading energy expert and uh, founder of Cambridge Energy Research Associates. But uh, um, do you, I wanted to ask you to sort of answer the same question. How do you think, as you look over the history of the U.S. role in the world and the role energy has played, what does it mean that the U.S. is experiencing this energy boom now? You know, I, I think as, as Carlos emphasized it's not a panacea. It doesn't mean uh, that everything is transformed, which I think was even in the immediate uh, beginnings of the uh, Ukraine crisis, we saw that sense. But it does really change uh, the balance of power uh, in the world to have this position. Uh, we can point to other examples that would follow from what Carlos said. If you look at, I mean, imagine if the U.S. was importing LNG today and Japan 
is in the position it is today, I mean, the, how would Japan have been able to hold together if, uh, in terms of uh, access to LNG? That's an example. And another example is the impact of what's happened here on, in part, explaining uh, the reforms that are unfolding in Mexico. So it does take uh, many different forms. And um, I think since we were here last time, I had the experience of uh, being uh, shouted at by Vladimir Putin about <laughs> shale gas. So I know how he feels about it, <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> Um, Ed, do you, uh, do you have thoughts on this question of sort of the U.S. Uh, approach to foreign policy? Sure, I do. Um, I think the setting is one of really disruptive change, and uh, it, we're trying to, from a policy perspective, people are trying to come to grips with the change. Is the change real? Is it going to be reversed? Um, what are some of the implications of it? And I think, you know, we're now almost at the position where uh, there's general recognition that uh, the ability to exploit these unconventional resources is real, is here to stay, and is here to stay for a very long time. And I think there are two observations I'd like to make along uh, Carlos's line. One, one is that effectively the LNG business is marketed as though it were a pipeline business. Uh, and the advent not just of the U.S. as potentially the largest LNG export in the world, but along with the US, Canada, and Australia, is really making a fundamental change in that market. And uh, you know, Sharif's facility is the first one that will make the change because there are off-takers from uh, the Chenier facility that are gonna buy, the, buy, buy and sell spot. They're gonna effectively buy in order to, or committing to buy in order to sell spot. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the US, Australia, and Canada, unlike Qatar, Indonesia, uh, or others in times past, is they can have these anti-competitive uh, behavioral patterns in which they have destination restrictions, in which they prevent the resale of cargoes. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, three major OECD countries with traditions of not allowing anti-competitive uh, behavior will be in the market. Uh, and it will surely not just encourage, but guarantee the encouragement of a spot market, and it will change the nature of the pricing mechanism. It will deprive countries that are pricing natural gas as though it were oil. It will deprive them of that rent, uh, and the consumer will benefit. And it, uh, it is uh, a benefit to the world as a whole, for uh, inadvertent, as it were, uh, as a result of this. The other uh, aspect of it, I think, uh, which we will see also over time, is the demonstration effect. Uh, and uh, you know, clearly, there are many countries that would like to uh, have shale or tight oil resources developed. Some of them have made mistakes. One prominent country in Europe uh, put in a tax system that was so prohibitive that it uh, drove away the investors. Uh, and now we're finding among the fastest growing producers in the world, uh, Argentina of all places, uh, where there is the resource base and the desire to get the resources. And uh, they're at a stage that many uh, uh, people who are cynical about whether Argentina would ever attract foreign investment uh, have to take a second look at it. Argentina was producing 12,000 barrels a day at the end of the fourth quarter of last year uh, and has now doubled that and it will go up fourfold between now and the end of the year. That's a remarkable demonstration effect that will, I think, further add to the supply resource being developed on a global basis and it's because of the demonstration effect coming out of the U.S. You mentioned Europe. Lord Mandelson, I wanted to ask you to sort of comment for a minute on European energy policy and what your sense is of how well it's working or not working to achieve different policy objectives. Security is one objective. Climate change is another uh, objective. There have been concerns that it hasn't been uh, necessarily uh, effective in doing that, but at the same time uh, has had impacts on prices and competitiveness. How do you, what's, what's your take on European energy policy, where it's working, where it's not, where it needs to be improved? Well, if you take a helicopter view of what's going on in Europe, you'd have to conclude uh, that things are not going terribly well. I mean, if you consider the policy objectives that we had, we set for ourselves when I was a member of the European Commission in 2005, 6 uh, we wanted um, uh, cheaper, more efficient, less costly energy, uh, we wanted lower carbon uh, emissions. Um, we wanted to uh, um, have our economy uh, with a, a stronger 
competitive uh, base and we wanted to play our uh, important role in the world in international uh, climate change negotiations. Well, if you look at the situation now, uh, our energy uh, is um, uh, more costly. Uh, our uh, our in industrial base is less competitive. Uh, we have poured tens of billions of euros into very subsidy-hungry uh, renewables. And whereas about 10 years ago, we were throwing something in the region of 0.24 tons of carbon into the atmosphere for every th $1,000 uh, of our GDP, for all the policy <coughs> focus and drive and money we have spent, we are still now throwing out something in the region of 0.24 <laughs> tons uh, per $1,000 uh, of GDP. So that is not uh, a very happy uh, situation for Europe to be in, which is why we look uh, at the United States energy uh, revolution <coughs> with colossal uh, envy. Uh, we see what uh, 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 this revolution, this energy boom has done uh, for economic competitiveness in this country, and we've seen too what it has done for your ability uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. So, you know, from a European standpoint, uh, you can't blame us for being very jealous. On the other hand, and I want to come back to the point Carlos was making uh, at the beginning, uh, what's happening in the United States uh, has the potential to be a major uh, driver of change in the global gas market for all the reasons uh, that you uh, set out. And that is very, very important for us uh, because in a world uh, where um, uh, uh, LNG export uh, volumes uh, uh, increase, uh, we will be moving to a situation uh, where gas is more competitive, more mobile, more flexible, more international, uh, or accessible uh, by us uh, at lower uh, cost. And in my view, if you look at, follow that structural th uh, trend uh, through, uh, you will uh, identify uh, the, the silver lining for Europe that comes from uh, the revolution uh, in the United States. Uh, it will enable us uh, both to uh, stand back from our current over-dependence on Russia, as Russia's share of the global gas market uh, uh, diminishes, and as we are able to look uh, to uh, more choices, alternative sources of supply, uh, hopefully to the United States, but to Australia, to Qatar, to East Africa in time, Eastern Mediterranean uh, in time, uh, 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 as well as existing suppliers. So short term, uh, we are slightly grisly and envious. In the longer term, uh, we are slightly more optimistic. And, and so the U.S. energy boom having more positive impacts in the longer term, you're not concerned about lower priced uh, natural gas, reduced competitiveness, sort of competition for manufacturing, is that? What can we do about it? <laughs> uh, we just have to put our own house in order. We've got to take advantage uh, of those changes that are taking place in the global ca gas market, uh, given that at the moment, you know, we're pouring a colossal amount of money uh, into renewables, uh, taking increasing at the moment volumes of carbon emitting uh, uh, coal uh, being displaced from the United States uh, market, throwing nuclear uh, out of the window uh, in many cases, uh, and not taking uh, not grabbing the opportunity that is offered to us uh, of natural gas, of shale, where it exists in different European countries. This is what, these are the different factors uh, and put, in my opinion, poor policy making uh, that is uh, created. Uh, not a shambles, that would be an overstatement, uh, but certainly a degree of incoherence in European policy making that we have to fa fa uh, find answers to. And I think in the 
uh, medium to longer term, what's happening in the United States will, as I say, be a driver uh, of, uh, of a transformation uh, of the global gas market. We have to take greater advantage in Europe uh, of greater gas uh, availability uh, at lower cost, and we've got to organize our energy mix and our policies in a way that enable us uh, to do so. So staying on the topic of European energy security for a minute, particularly in the context of what's happening with Russia and uh, the Ukraine, Carlos, can you talk for a minute about what role energy is playing in the current crisis? Uh, what steps can Europe or the Ukraine reasonably take to reduce dependence on Russian gas, and what steps the U.S. government um, can, is taking, is taking to help facilitate that? And how important LNG exports, which kind of gets most a lot of attention, kind of fits in that versus lots of other things? Sure. No, I, I'd be glad to address it. And I, I'm, I'm just literally off the plane coming back from Ukraine um, and uh, having stopped in London on the way. Yeah, and and should add, uh, Carlos was also ambassador to Ukraine, so uh, <laughs> extra dimension. <laughs> it, um, look, one of the issues which um, uh, is a fundamental factor in question in Ukraine and it has been in many of the former Soviet countries, is that energy has been a fundamental source of corruption. And in order to deal with the viability of these economies, their politics, the independence of their systems, they have to be able to produce energy, they have to do it on a transparent basis, they have to be able to attract private investors, they have to advance diversification. And so one of the key issues that is facing Ukraine right now is how do they create a picture for an energy future where they can produce more, that it can be done on a competitive basis, that it can attract private investment, and that will give them options for the future. So the first thing on Ukraine that's absolutely critical is to recognize that there is an option for the future, that you're not just playing the short-term game. They have significant supplies of natural gas. Ukraine right now consumes about 50 billion cubic meters of gas a year. About 28 um, billion cubic meters of that is imported from Russia, about 2 billion they get from the West, and about 20 million gets produced domestically. Of that 20 billion cubic meters, they could realistically expand that by some 30 percent and perhaps more through investment in new technology. They're using the same technology that they used during the Soviet period in the 1970s, and I'm sure that these two gentlemen sitting at the end there have great ideas of what they could potentially do by engaging in the Ukrainian market. They have the ability to produce shale gas. Um, last year, Ukraine signed contracts with Chevron, uh, Shell, any uh, for shale gas developments. And over a 10-year uh, period, or by 2020, realistically, that could be expanded by 15 to 20 billion cubic meters. Ukraine has had huge subsidies in gas. In the past, it constituted about $13 billion a year, 7% of GDP. And so they have already started on May 1st, the beginning of phasing out of those gas subsidies, which will create an incentive for energy efficiency. And if you bring those factors together, it presents a, a situation where by 2020 or soon afterwards, Ukraine could be in a position between more production and efficiency to have choices about whether it imports Russian gas or not. Now, in the short term, the answer then becomes, what can Ukraine do to create some of its options? And so one of the things that the United States, the European community, Ukraine's neighbors have been working on are what are called so-called reverse flows. The ability to use this European gas market that now allows gas to be traded north to south, east to west, west to east, to be able to move gas so-called backwards back into Ukraine. So there's already about one and a half billion cubic meters of gas capacity in Poland. It's small, but that has already begun. In Hungary, the potential is as high as 6.1 billion cubic meters a year. And those negotiations are on track and potentially we'll see some results of that soon. On April 28th, Ukraine and Slovakia signed an agreement that will create a physical capacity to begin importing 3.2 billion cubic meters a year, expandable to between 8 and 10. So if those mechanisms are put in place, what it will begin to do is give Ukraine the ability to have some diversification of supply so that it's not just dependent on supplies from the East. The other key factor is to recognize that Russia Ukraine is going to have to buy gas from Russia. It absolutely needs to do that at some level. And so the critical challenge is to put that purchase, that trade in gas on market commercial terms. And this is where it's so crucial that the European Union is playing a role. 
And what the EU has done is to try to create a competitive gas market in Europe. And in that market, there are certain characteristics. The market defines prices. The market establishes that those who purchase the gas have the right to trade it. And the market also requires that those who consume the gas actually pay their bills. And so there you have the foundations for a negotiation between Russia and Ukraine on price, on trade, on payment of bills that provides a degree of transparency that could give this a potential resolution. Final thing I just want to say on this is the importance of Europe's active engagement. And I know that many European countries are concerned about this because there is a huge dependency on imported gas from Russia. But look at it from this perspective. Today, Russia is invested in 220 billion cubic meters of pipeline capacity to Europe. 220 billion cubic meters. Supplying somewhere in the range of 150 to 160, to, including all countries, and not just the European Union. Russia has 14, 14 billion cubic meters of export capacity to Asia. If Russia does not sell gas to Europe, it is decimating its own gas industry. And so this is the moment of opportunity to do exactly what Lord Mattingly has said, is to create the options for diversification of supply. There is no doubt that in 10 years, Russia is going to have pipelines to China. There is no doubt that they will have greater export LNG capacity because Asia is the fastest growing gas market in the world. Europe has this opportunity to use this moment in a way that advances its own diversification, but it puts this in a realistic perspective, that now is the time when they can use that market power of 400 million consumers to be able to clearly define and insist on the rules of the marketplace in price and in competition, and ensuring that those rules are extended to Ukraine as well as part of the European energy community. Just a very quick follow-up, and then I want to ask Ed and Dan to come in on this. Um, the uh, U.S. recently announced sanctions against some specific people and entities, including Igor Sechin, the head of Gazprom. Can you talk about where sanctions policy could go to uh, address the concerns with Russia's actions now and, and how they might be used in the energy sector or how limited the ability to use them is given what a major supplier uh, of oil and gas Russia is? Does that constrain the ability to use sanctions as a tool? Um, the purpose of sanctions is to draw a red line on Russian behavior. Um, Russia has obviously um, uh, taken, um, invaded the territorial integrity of Ukraine and Crimea, and perhaps just as disconcerting is the role that Russian security forces have been playing in the eastern parts of Ukraine, where the, the objective has not necessarily been interrupt in intervention or um, control, but to disruption. And as we've seen over time, it's a lot easier to disrupt with a few people creating chaos and taking buildings and finding local groups to transfer them to them than to create a clear and defined course for the future. And so the message that we, the United States and Europe have been trying to send with sanctions is that continuing this behavior is going to have a cost and that those sanctions will continue to be ratcheted up unless we move back to a, 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 an example of conduct in the international community which is transparent and inconsistent with international law. There have been many comments about what might happen in the energy sector and the president has held open the prospect of energy sector sanctions. When we talk about this, it's not in the context of the way that we saw sanctions against Iran, where what we were trying to do is cut off the exports of Iranian, um, uh, cut off Iranian exports into the international community. Russia is a critical supplier of oil and gas. We want to, want to see it to continue to supply that oil and gas on market competitive terms. We want to see Russia and Europe recognize the mutual interest they have in continuing transparent market relations. But what energy is important for as well is maintaining the confidence of capital markets in Russia's economy. Russia depends on hydrocarbon exports for 70% of its export revenue, for 52% of its budget revenue. And so to the extent to which there are signals that are sent 
that affect the confidence of Russia's hydrocarbons industry to be, to be able to continue to grow. That is not a signal just about the Russian energy sector. It's about the ability of Russian capital markets and the interest of international capital markets to continue to finance Russia and the cost that they're going to pay for that debt. And so that is the critical point, I think, Jason, that we come back to in the energy sanctions. I'm not going to speculate what they would be. The United States and Europe have an interest in coordinating those steps together. We have had significant discussions on how to be able to move them forward. What we have made very clear is that if there isn't a change in behavior that <coughs> demonstrates a willingness to abide by transparency and adherence to international law, then there will be a cost. And the cost is not so much in energy per se. The cost is going to be in the impact that this will have on capital markets and their willingness to finance Russia. So I want to ask Ed and Dan to come in on this. I'll just, for people's situational, we're going to say uh, John Podesta's plane delay set us back slightly, so we're going to go about 10 to 15 minutes over. Uh, and apologies for that, but this is too good a group to sort of cut off uh, this soon. Um, Ed, can you comment? Uh, there's a lot of things here to talk about, uh, but uh, take any piece of it you want, but uh, in particular thinking about uh, the security of supply, the energy security, and, you, and, and what can be done in terms of uh, policy to help Europe and to address uh, concerns with Russian behavior? Um, I, I think I'd uh, rather not comment further. I think we've covered much of that territory. I'm happy to comment on some other. Well, there's a tar aspects. another question specifically for you, uh, which is on a different topic, uh, which is about the remarkable stability we've seen in the crude oil price for the last three years. And the question targeted for you is what killed crude volatility and what will cause it to come back? Yeah, well, volatility was not just killed in the crude oil market, it was killed across all asset classes. So it's a, it's a much bigger puzzle. I think on the oil market side, the, the geopolitical puzzle is, uh, is the following. It's not just uh, the sudden unexpected uh, emergence of the Russian supply that's uh, come into uh, the, the marketplace, but we have since uh, February 2011 seen a remarkable growth of disruption to supply uh, in the market. Uh, before the first Libyan disruption, there was a less than a half a million barrels a day of oil not in the marketplace. Since the Libyan disruption, that number has grown. Uh, and if you add the non-OPEC supply, the OPEC supply that is off market, and add to that the amount of Iranian crude that's not in the market, uh, we're at like three and a half million barrels a day of oil that was expected to be in the market that's not in the market. Um, this is something that's clearly going to be with us for a long time because it in many ways represents the Iranian sanctions aside, the, 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 the failure of the petrostate to deliver in governance. Uh, and I think we will see the same forces that uh, have brought about uh, civil disorder in many oil producing countries continue to do so uh, and maybe ratchet up a bit. The really remarkable phenomenon is the market's non-reaction. It's not just the oil market's non-reaction, but financial markets have not reacted to Ukraine, they've not reacted to oil disruption, and oil prices have actually been increasingly stable uh, over time since the February 2011 uh, Libyan disruption. Not only stable in terms of the average price of Brent, and of course what's happening in our markets is uh, another issue, but uh, the trading range has narrowed from 88, 89 to 120 to something on the order of 103 to 112 for Brent. So uh, it's a remarkable puzzle and uh, the question is whether the new supply coming in from Canada, the U.S. and increasingly from other places will be the balancing factor in the market that will allow the world to undergo uh, a record amount of disruption in traditional flows, uh, which is a record not only in the volume, but a record in terms of the, the dispersion of the disruption to as many countries uh, as we've seen with more potentially on the horizon. Dan, can I ask you to respond to? Well, I, yeah, I wanted to do that, but I thought first, if you don't mind, I will like to come back and answer, but Peter was, Lord Mandelson was the trade commissioner of the EU and I'd love to hear from him about sanctions and, and your view of, of the use of sanctions now and the situation and the efficacy. And then I'll come back. Yeah. Well, I'm not uh, in office, and so I have the luxury 
uh, of commenting on this uh, from this uh, stage rather than from within the government. But my view is that uh, sanctions are, are necessary, inevitable, um, that they uh, will, if uh, Russia continues to introduce further instability uh, in to Ukraine, uh, need to go to a third stage. I think in those circumstances, the sanctions will target uh, state-related Russian companies rather than uh, individuals. Uh, and I think that uh, however loath they are uh, to see this further stage being reached, I think that key European nations are, are sort of girding themselves uh, uh, for uh, this possibility. Um, I can't judge uh, what's going on in Mr. Putin's head. Uh, I heard uh, what he had to say yesterday, uh, and I think we have to treat what he says uh, with a degree of skepticism. Uh, I don't mean rejection <coughs> or hostility, I mean literally skepticism. Uh, we, we have to question uh, how sincere uh, he is in what he says, uh, and we have to see uh, r real events, real people on the ground uh, reflecting uh, what he is saying before we can draw the conclusion uh, that he is actually seeking to de-escalate uh, this situation. Second point I would make is this. People in Europe uh, will be uh, very strongly opposed <coughs> uh, to uh, energy uh, being used as a <clears throat> as, a, uh, as an instrument uh, or a trigger uh, uh, um, uh, to escalate uh, our counteraction against what Mr. Putin is doing in Ukraine. Uh, and therefore we would uh, want to see financial services, capital markets uh, uh, and flows targeted uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a way of sanctioning uh, 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 Russia, uh, rather than sort of mounting any sort of um, sanction or embargo or blockade uh, against uh, Russian energy. I don't need to explain why that is the case, given uh, the uh, dependency uh, of uh, uh, Europe generally uh, on Russian sources, and given the position of Germany and Italy in particular as Russia's largest uh, customers, uh, the possibility of either of those two countries or others uh, 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 agreeing to uh, using sort of energy uh, as, a, 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 as a lever in this, uh, 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 well, just don't hold your breath uh, uh, for it. Last point I'd make is this. Um, in its energy relationship uh, with Russia, you know, Europe is not heading for divorce. I mean, the relationship is too big uh, for that, and it will continue to be big, and it creates a source of uh, dependence, mutual dependence, between Europe and Russia uh, for anyone uh, to contemplate uh, divorce, uh, even in the medium term. On the other hand, Europe is going to become far, far less monogamous in that relationship it has uh, with Russia. Uh, the emphasis on creating greater energy uh, resilience, already we are far more resilient in Europe than we were uh, when the last interruption of supply occurred in 2009, not least because of the expansion of gas storage and because of the uh, investment in interconnectors. And that, uh, and that has got to uh, 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 grow. Uh, but above all, we've got to look to those choices and alternatives, taking advantage of changes in the, in globe, in the global marketplace uh, over time to reduce our dependence uh, on Russian uh, uh, gas. Last point I'd make also is this. Russia has as much to lose from playing about uh, with energy supply, uh, even to Ukraine, let alone uh, uh, the rest of Europe, uh, as we have uh, uh, as a cost uh, in, in, in playing around uh, with our supply. If Russia moves 
and interrupt supply, even to Ukraine, that will send a massive signal to the rest of Europe, but it will also send a massive signal uh, to the East, to Asia. And if they want to adjust uh, their uh, uh, um, uh, 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 market mix and look more to the East and to Asia uh, uh, to find uh, outlets uh, for their energy, then they better uh, uh, step back uh, uh, from, uh, from breaching uh, that trust as a supplier because what everyone will uh, uh, see in the future is one he heck of a big need not to become, not themselves, to become reliant uh, on Russia as a supplier in the future. If this is the sort of action that they're prepared to take, even in relation to Ukraine, let alone, as I say, the rest of Europe. Dan, you should pick up any piece of that you want. There's a lot there, but I'm particularly interested also in your thoughts. We're talking a lot about energy security and uh, what that phrase means to you and how in the U.S. where we talk a lot about we're not importing gas anymore, we're importing much less oil, what does it mean to be more energy secure for our country? Right. Well, let me, if I can, respond to some of these points too. Uh, a lot of wisdom has, has just been spoken, but it's striking that we are sort of a little bit back in a sort of Cold War, a lot of effort went into trying to assess what are the intentions of the Kremlin. That kind of went out of fashion, and yet here we are again. What are the intentions of the Kremlin? Was this an impulsive response to the sense that uh, Ukraine was going to move into, uh, into the Western sphere and no longer be part of this Russian sphere of privileged interest? Uh, was it uh, the fact that, as President Putin has said, uh, in 2007, Ukraine's not a country? Um, or was this a long strategy and so forth? And what kind of game is it being invented as it goes along or not? And I'm sure Carlos has some views of that. But uh, the point that Peter made about Russia has spent five decades trying to establish that it is a reliable supplier to Europe, except a few countries to the east. And that, uh, in fact, just recently, the number two at Gazprom said gas, <coughs> natural gas is not a, a weapon, it's a commodity in that point. And exactly, and now that Mr. Putin in two weeks will be in Beijing talking about a gas deal with the Chinese, and the point that Peter made is something that will be actually hanging uh, over that. I think when we talk about sanctions, uh, there has to be coordination with the Europeans, uh, and uh, they will have somewhat different uh, perspectives on it because of a different kind of engagement. I think there's also always the question with sanctions of unintended consequences. You hear about, you know, sort of garden variety financial institutions who now find that they have a problem in, uh, because they have loans that they need to make some changes in. Are they violating sanctions? And we don't want sanctions that will hurt the countries of uh, Eastern Europe. So getting them right is quite a challenge. But I think that um, uh, maybe the real impact of this and you know, what explains what happened yesterday in Mr. Putin's statements, we don't know. Uh, maybe it was just looking, saying this thing is getting out of control and there can be unintended consequences. But one effect is those who are at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum last June will remember the big theme is that Russia needs foreign investment because its growth rate has plummeted from about 7% to about 1% or maybe 0%. Well, one thing that's probably as a result of this, sanctions or no sanctions, that most every company, at least thinking for the future, when they go to their board to talk about what are they going to do in Russia, many of them will look at the calculations differently uh, than they might have uh, a year ago. And that's a very important issue when part of the deal that the Kremlin has with the Russian people is we will deliver a higher standard of living to you uh, rather than no growth. And I think to kind of wind up, Carlos talked about a deal on gas between Russia and Ukraine, and that points to the larger thing, that either there's some kind of negotiated settlement, there's some kind of agreement about going forward, uh, maybe one that will not be very clear about a federal or still a unitary state of Ukraine, but some way to resolve this, because the alternative for everybody uh, is a bad situation. This wouldn't be like Transnistria, or this wouldn't be like Ab Abkhazia, sort of a gray zone. This would be a big sore uh, in Europe, and so uh, you know, maybe maybe that's what's going to begin, and we'll see how well these elections go on. So that's a long preamble to the question of what does energy security mean. Um, I think, and you know, uh, I think it means a lot of different things. 
uh, but it means being able to deal with emergencies, it means resilience, and it means uh, ensuring that the investment is being made, uh, that you have the type of energy uh, resources uh, and capabilities uh, that you need in the future. And I think it also goes to very much what Dan Poneman was talking about, uh, having the information, high quality information, to among other things, avoid panic. So that's why it's really important that you were at that gas station in Queens. <laughs> Uh, I wish we had much more time to talk about lots of other places in the world, particularly um, China in light of this week's developments in the South China Seeds and, uh, and other things. Um, I want to close just by uh, taking one question via social media uh, from Student Energy, uh, which is, what is the one market or geopolitical trend that students should pay attention to when developing their future career plans? Can we start with you, Ed, or are you thinking? Professor Morse. <laughs> Yeah, I think disruptive technology is the place to look. I think uh, we've seen disruptive technology at work uh, in the, being able to get this unconventional revolution going. We see disruptive technologies at work in uh, power generating system. I think uh, follow the technological line and uh, we'll see disruptive forces. And when there are di disruptive forces, there are always winners and losers. And that's what geopolitics is all about. Any thoughts? I, I, I bow to your superior wisdom. <laughs> uh, it se seems to me uh, that uh, uh, looking to technological disruption um, uh, is, is fine, but, disrupt but the use of the word disruption brings home to us all, I hope, that whatever virtues and advantages the United States now has in its energy revolution, the world continues to be a very interdependent place. The global economy continues to be very uh, integrated. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, isolationism, in whatever form or manifestation it takes, is not, in my view, uh, an attractive consequence of greater energy self-sufficiency in the United States. The United States, I'm afraid, remains the world's indispensable nation. And that means there will be very firm limits on how much you can disengage and withdraw from the rest of the world. Carlos, advice for um, I, students? Huge wisdom in Ed's point, and I, I would just rather than say disruptive te technology, I would say uh, transformative technology, and the intersection of those transformative technologies with markets, with capital markets, um, with entrepreneurship. You know, if you think about the United States in 2005, shale gas was 1% of US production. Today, it's 35% of US gas production. That's an example of how the technology, the resource, and the markets actually combine. The other thing that I, I would say, just looking ahead over the next decade, is the transformative nature of natural gas markets and the phenomenal way that they are changing. Um, the advent of LNG, and Sharif is you know, at the center of that, is having a massive impact on those markets. But the geopolitical implications of this, of creating competition and trade, the way it affects major suppliers, the way it impacts consumers, is huge in magnitude in politics and economics and in technology. And it's a fascinating area in which to engage. Closing so, word of advice. So I thought I could uh, extract uh, uh, one sentence summary from the quest and a one sentence summary from the prize. <laughs> uh, I think the quest is what Ed pointed to and has been modified. Uh, disruption, uh, you know, you can just think, it does seem every three or, I mean, we all sort of think we know where the world's going and every three, four, five years ago, something comes along, a financial crisis, a Fukushima, uh, shale gas, upheaval uh, in the Arab world, etc., and you get you kind of move into a different reality. So I think disruption and surprise is one lesson. The other in the prize, as I sometimes look back at that book, it has hundreds and hundreds of very interesting characters. But the two most important characters in that book are, I believe, supply and demand. So I think that the other thing that is uh, very important is uh, actually seeking to understand uh, how these energy markets work and how they're changing. Great. I think everyone is familiar with those, but sometimes people are 
uh, new and learning about energy or students are new to the field. And so the quest and the prize, uh, the prize for which Dan won the Pulitzer Prize and the quest uh, more recent book, both of which are absolute must reads to understand the history of US energy and what's happening in the US uh, energy space now, which are certainly assigned in my course and I know lots of other people's uh, as well. Uh, so I appreciate your indulgence going a few minutes over. I really appreciate our panelists' time uh, being uh, with us today and some like Lord Mandelson traveling from far uh, to be here. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this and, and learned as much from it uh, as I have. And uh, we will be back next spring with another uh, annual forum, as well as many, many programs and conferences and speakers uh, and lectures in between, uh, as well as research coming out of the center. So I'd invite everyone now uh, to not only uh, give everyone here uh, a round of applause, but also then to join us for a reception in the faculty room, which is directly behind the stage. Thank you. Thank you.